hey, hey, hey. It's Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. And uh, it's time for a review of the new Mountain Goats album, Goth. Goths. The Mountain Goats are a long-running musical project spearheaded by a singer, songwriter, storyteller extraordinaire, Mr. John Darneal, who has been recording albums both lo-fi and hi-fi since, like, the early 90s. Since then, John has amassed a discography that would most likely make a newcomer turn and run in the other direction uh, out of fear of getting lost or just not knowing where to start. If you want to listen to some of the project's modern classics, though, uh, uh, I guess I recommend Tallahassee or The Sunset Tree, though I personally feel the band has been on a bit of a creative streak as of late, too. 2015's Beat the Champ did have a few musical duds on it, but it was a record that was passionately and dramatically dedicated to the world of professional wrestling, making for one of the Mountain Goat's most fun and exciting releases. Goths is also deeply thematic, but uh, centers around a topic that is likely to not garner quite as much attention. Goths. Liter literally goth, like as a subculture. The clothes, the makeup, the time period, the music, the major artistic figures, the locations. John touches on all of these topics and more in a series of tracks that feature lyrics that read as if he's getting a chance to write about his favorite thing ever. And John also uses the goth concept to explore other themes, uh, such as individuality, transformation, darkness, getting old, becoming irrelevant, and the world forcing you to become something that you don't want to be. For a bulk of the album, John deals with characters who are having a tough time for one reason or another, staying on the dark path. The song Andrew Eldritch is moving back to Leeds is about the Sisters of Mercy frontman returning home and reconnecting with his roots, his old friends after the golden years of goth were up. John symbolically referencing an old fog machine that nobody wants anymore to sort of drive his point of irrelevancy home. On the Grey King and the Silver Flame attunement, our protagonists aren't dealing with irrelevancy, but fear. Fear through an initiation that brought them to a near-death experience. Uh, the person John is narrating from the perspective of just kind of sits there and wonders whether or not he has uh, the capacity to uh, live up to the extremity of this lifestyle in the chorus when he repeats, uh, I'm hardcore, but I'm not that hardcore. Which as the song progresses, he gets more and more uh, sort of emotional and uh, subtle and quiet, uh, delivering it. I'm not that hardcore. The song Unicorn Tolerance seems to play with the other side of this dynamic with the protagonist being so wholeheartedly devoted to the darkness that he can sort of stay in that mindset in the face of uh, unicorns. Basically just a symbol for things that are bright, are pure, are friendly, are good. So they're staying goth in the face of good and staying goth in the face of ejection out of the music industry on the song Shelved, which seems to feature an 80s goth musician trying to transform, transition into what the 90s are demanding of him. He says he doesn't want to write songs with this clown he's been paired up with by his label in some LA music studio. He says he doesn't want to tour with Trent Reznor last on a bill of three. In the final verse of the track, he comes to terms with just giving up on the entire thing, talking about going to write code for LucasArts, of all things, uh, which is pretty hilarious. But it's still kind of a song of devotion because the protagonist here would much rather just give up his vision entirely than change it or alter it or water it down just so that he could stay in the industry. There are similar themes on the song Abandoned Flesh, which is a track centered specifically around one group in the goth movement, Gene Loves Jezebel, a literal footnote in the encyclopedia of goth. In this one song, John seems to tell what is at least most of the band's unsuccessful uh, life story, making tongue-in-cheek references to the singer leaving, to the band's Wikipedia page, and contrasting their lack of success with an artist like Susie Sue, who uh, John says has enough hits uh, so that uh, the, the, her bills continue to be paid. This is the finishing track, though, and the finishing words of this song, uh, I think, sum up the entire theme of the album better than the finishing words of any other Mountain Goats record. However big that chorus bass may throb, you and me and all of us are gonna have to find a job. Because the world will never know or understand the suffocated splendor of the once future goth band. It's just all about this sound, this culture, this movement that 
just kind of came and went. It had its time. It was here and it was gone. And John's obsession with most of it is those kind of transition points. The difficulties artists had uh, transitioning into this world, transitioning out of this world. There are other deep cuts on the album that deal in other facets of the culture. The song We Do It Different on the West Coast is kind of about a, a bunch of different goth scenes cropping up all across America, Europe. The song Stench of the Unburied is uh, basically a, a vivid depiction of all the minor and very funny and entertaining details of a band in the midst of a tour. And the song Wear Black is all about kind of embracing darkness in the face of hardship and turmoil, uh, specifically wearing black uh, to the intervention. Probably one of the most darkly hilarious moments on the entire record. But despite the lyrical themes of this album, the music on the record is decidedly not goth at all. The closest John and company come to doing this is when all of a sudden in the second half of the song Shelved, this swaying dance beat pops in, a driving bass line, and a vocal melody that seems like it's been pulled out of the New Order playbook. That being said though, Goths is easily one of the Mountain Goat's most musically diverse albums yet. I was kind of worried going into this record once I heard the entire album was going to be guitarless. Not that the Mountain Goats haven't written songs before sans guitar, uh, but it is kind of John's main axe. You expect to at least hear a handful of times on an album. So a bit of an expectation curve there. Uh, compound that with uh, moments like Wear Black, where you have like this gospel style chorus kind of working its way into there. The strangely poppy and sweet instrumentation on the song Unicorn Tolerance, and the really jazzy horns and chord progressions on the track Paid in Cocaine. As a longtime fan, I needed a little time with this record to adjust and just kind of acclimate myself to not only the instrumental palette of this record, but what John was trying to say with the theme. But once I got a better grasp of that, I warmed up to the instrumentals on this record quite a bit, because some of them stylistically play off of the theme or the story of the song ingeniously. Case in point, the very laid back and chill funk of the song Rage in Traverse, which when I first heard it, I wished was a little bit more lively, urgent, wish it just had more teeth or something. But then once I got into the lyrics, the track is essentially about an aging, like hard rocker from the 70s having a hard time finding relevance in the 80s, and when he happens upon this goth club, he's sort of horrified by what he sees, uh, uh, not only because of just the darkness uh, and just kind of how wild and weird it is, but uh, also having to come to terms with the fact that he, he is just not as relevant as he used to be. There are a few tracks in the track listing that just kind of sound like mere average Mountain Goat songs, but just no guitar has uh, been placed into the mix. But there are definitely more musical hits than misses on this thing, uh, mostly the song Rain in Soho. Incredible opener, undeniably one of the Goat's most powerful songs to date, thanks to its grim pianos and thumping kick drum and really epic uh, choral contributions, which are not only beautiful, but add a lot of character to the mix, especially as they're uh, chanting in unison, no, 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 no. The Mountain Goats really do take advantage of the lack of guitar on this album by bringing in more horns, more woodwinds, more piano, more bass, more background vocals. All the stuff they've been incorporating into their recent work, but, you know, just upped a little bit. A gradual and finely executed increase. In a way, all of it kind of seems like an overly ambitious self-reference uh, to the band or to the album itself, uh, because on the song Shelved, you do have a moment where the protagonist cries out about wanting to play his guitar, but he can't because uh, goth in the 90s and the early 2000s was kind of transitioning into something completely different than what it was in the 80s. I'm most likely giving the album uh, a little too much credit there, and not that it does doesn't deserve it. This is probably one of my favorite Mountain Goats albums in a while. I definitely enjoyed it a shade more than Beat the Champ. Musically, it enthralled me more, and topically, uh, being more of a music nerd myself, uh, I guess I probably got more out of this than I would an album about wrestling, though, I mean, I loved the fuck out of wrestling when I was a kid. My point is, I think this is one of the band's better records topically, musically. However, uh, the Mountain Goats will never get credit for it. Because unfortunately, John, album after album, just 
refuses to fold to the typical cliches of the singer-songwriter, which audiences endlessly demand from this particular artist base to the point where I wonder if they're even half aware of just how cliche and redundant their desires are. Is it any coincidence that two of the Mountain Goat's biggest records center around a crumbling relationship and John Darnielle's traumatic youth? If you think this is because John's best songs just happen to land on those records, uh, uh, in my humble opinion, you are sorely mistaken. Long before John recorded either of those albums, to me, he was just a really great and adventurous storyteller. That is what originally attracted me to the Mountain Goats, and that is what is attracting me to this album over here. This record, in a way, is almost an extension of one of my favorite Mountain Goat songs of all time. The opening track to the album All Hail West Texas, uh, a song about a death metal band uh, that basically folded because the entire world around them just said, no, you're not doing this. This isn't happening. And John kind of paints these guys as underdogs, as unsung heroes, two guys who fought with all their might but eventually lost in the battle of being themselves. That very same battle is being played out on goths, but on a much grander and sort of niche scale. And it does so with creative instrumentation, with great production. John can certainly still act his way through a song too. He's not really phoning it in here in my opinion. And at least from the perspective of, of this music nerd, uh, some of his most intriguing lyrics to date. I'm feeling a strong eight on this record. Tra-tran. Position, have you given this album a listen? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Did it turn you a little goth? Let me know if it turned you a little goth, made you want to be a little bit more goth. And um, I will catch you guys in the next review. Uh, Anthony Fantano, Mountain Goats, Goths. Uh, videos next to my head you should check out. Subscribe to the channel. Official website too, forever.